verifiers and interactive proofs. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thinking, thank you for coming this hour, this morning. So this is joint work with Moni Noor and Rav Parter. So I'm going to talk about interactive proofs, and we're going to talk about having an interactive proof where the verifier is actually distributed. So this is going to be our prover throughout our talk. Uh, this nice guy is the honest prover. So we have interactive proofs, and um, we saw them a lot this week, and I'm not going to go over the, the definitions. We have completeness, we have soundness, okay, respect to some uh, language L. As we saw, they're very useful. We like to study them. They actually led to the notions of PCP and zero knowledge. They're very powerful, you know, that IP equals P space. Uh, but I want to just, for one second, step back and ask, uh, when to use an interactive proof. So the maybe general setting is that the verifier is some, somehow computationally bounded, and we think of the prover as uh, unbounded, and this strong prover wants to prove something to this weak verifier. You can also have doubly efficient protocols where the prover, the prover is still computationally bounded, but the verifier just runs in less computational time. You can also talk about a prover that has a verifier that has limited space, okay, and the prover doesn't have this limitation. And uh, in general, what we want, we use them when the prover is somehow the the verifier somehow you know his hands is, is tied in some way, and the prover doesn't have this limitation. So the limitation that I want to talk about today is actually well, the verifier is not a single centralized unit; it's a distributed protocol. So instead of this single verifier, what we're going to have here is actually a distributed protocol, and I'm going to define exactly what I mean, and I already see a question. How come the proof is on the right? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's not the first time I got this comment. I think I used to do it the other way, and then somebody asked me why you do it, and somehow I switched and got, got stuck. Okay. So... Uh, I think in the video, maybe we can just say, uh, you know. Um, okay, so just before I define the formal uh, model, uh, some motivation. So already Yuval at the beginning of the workshop, workshop this is like a snippet from his uh, slides. He talked about this modular approach where he takes this proof system and extracts out information uh, theoretic setting, and then we have these crypto compilers and such. And so this model, one benefit is it is information theoretic, and we're going to talk about mainly communication and uh, not have, uh, well, at least until the end of the talk, any computational assumptions. Um, another motivation, so maybe the verifier is just happened to be, it's not a single unit, maybe it's a whole network, okay, I don't know, maybe it's the Bitcoin network, or just people around the world that they somehow want to join, jointly verify this proof. And lastly, um, we talked a lot about the efficiency of these protocols, and a lot about the efficiency of the prover and the verifier. One way to gain efficiency in the verifier is say, okay, maybe my verifier is not my weak, uh, my weak phone or smartwatch, okay, it's, uh, I don't know, Google wants to prove something to Facebook, and uh, Facebook has a lot of computers, so they can distribute this verifier, okay, to run it more, more quickly. Okay, so let's see the model. So this model was actually introduced by Kolo Schramm and Saxena as a journalization of uh, Korman, Kutten, and Peleg in 05. Um, so they defined like the non-interactive version and they generalized, generalized this to the interactive version. So we, we already saw this model, I think, yesterday and also so Henry and Ale talked about it and Justin also talked about it a little in the open problem session. So we have approvers and we have two verifiers and their input is split between X1 and X2. And then the prover can send messages to both, and they can uh, communicate. And then there's <coughs> all sorts of questions here. Can Alice talk to Bob and Bob to Alice? And, and how exactly the communication 
uh, goes, and each different model really is, uh, is, is somewhat different. I want to take this to, to the extreme. So what happens when I add a third guy? Okay, so now I have three parties, and my input is distributed between three parties. And now the really question here, okay, do I do this triangle? Can any party talk to any party? Okay, so now I can say, okay, maybe only one can talk to two and three can talk to two. And I have different configurations. So if I really push this for forward, I can just have n parties. Okay, so I have one prover. I have n parties, n computational units. <coughs> the input is going to be distributed between these n units. So I have x1 to xn. And now I have some graph g that defines the communication pattern that they can talk. Okay, so the, any graph G. Okay, I'm only gonna assume throughout this talk that the graph is connected. Okay, if the graph is not connected, then really you, you have nothing that you can do. And now my input, okay, is actually gonna define, is gonna be defined by all the X1 to Xn, all the single individual input, and also this graph G. Okay, so I'm just going to put it also as part of the input. So I'm not assuming that these nodes know the whole input. They don't know the other Xi's, and they might not know the graph G. They only know their local view in this graph. Okay. Do so they verify each other? Yeah, yeah. We're going to see this example. That's a good question. In my model, the prover is going to be either honest or a cheating prover. All the verifiers are cooperating and honest. Okay, I'm not going to talk about like verifiers that are malicious. That's a good direction for future work. Yeah. So maybe this graph is not of interest. Maybe it's just a public graph that everybody knows. Okay, then I only care about these inputs. And actually, in some cases, people don't care about the individual inputs, but only about the graph. Okay, and you might have something that cares about both. Okay, so this is like the most general setting. Okay. So, what is the model? So, we're going to talk about public coin protocols. Okay, we're going to call this distributed AM. Okay, so this is an example of a, how would, I would define a two-round protocol. So, every node U in the graph okay, is going to send some random challenge, RU, okay, so they don't have common randomness, okay, every node just samples a string RU and sends it, so this is going to be an L bit string, okay, some parameter L. The prover is going to respond with a personal message MU, okay, so this might be a different message for each and every node, again, L bits. Then the nodes are just going to exchange RU and MU, Okay, the proof that they got and the challenge that they sent with their immediate neighbors in the graph. Okay, because this is the only people they can talk to. And they have to decide if to accept or reject. In this case, we're going to say that the proof size is L. Okay, because this was the bound on every single uh, edge. Okay, so the proof size is going to be L. And uh, if we have more rounds, then L is going to be like the total bound uh, on an edge throughout all the rounds. Uh, so my input is the graph and all these, and for completeness, I want that if X is in the language, then with high probability, all nodes accept. Then if soundness says that if X is not a language, there exists at least one single node, okay, only one that, you know, says, I disagree. I reject. Yeah. I didn't catch in the earlier slide. What is each verifier's access to the graph G? Is it an explicit input, or do they have horrible access to it? Yeah. So each node has knows its individual input x i, and with respect to G, he just knows his immediate neighbors in the graph. Okay. So you can assume that the nodes have unique IDs. Okay. And uh, he knows that he can send message to his neighbors. Okay, so he has this local view of G. Yeah. The issue is, uh, is uh, communication, or the issue is cryptography. What is why do why 
if if I make the graph complete graph, things will yeah. So we'll see exactly the limits, okay, in a second, and the issue is communication, and we're exactly going to see the limits of what is a trivial communication and what we're aiming for, okay? Just the next slide. Um, so in this model, I'm not going to assume any computation limits on the on the nodes, okay? Even though our results, the nodes are very efficient, but okay, generally I'm not assuming. I want to abstract this out, so I'm only talking about the communication. Okay. Notation-wise, so if it's two rounds, we'll have like this distributed AM, three rounds, okay, M, A, M, and general distributed IP with R rounds, and FN is like the communication complex. The proof size. I'm going to call it the proof size. You're using the usual conventions of public coin and private coin, like AM, public coin. And yeah, this is going to be like public coin, and this also private coin, even though I didn't define what is private coin here, and there's like, okay. yeah, I'm going to talk mainly about public coin. Is there more rounds? What's the communication between the verifiers? Just once in the end, or after? Just once in the end. So they talk back and forth with the prover, and then they send one message to neighbors? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let's see a very simple example. So suppose your language really has no inputs, the, only the graph is, is what you care about, and you want to prove that this graph has a three coloring. Okay, so what is the prover going to do? He's just going to compute this three coloring of the graph. He's going to send every node a color. Okay, so this is like two bits. And then they're go just going to exchange this color with their neighbors and verify this, this is a legal coloring. Okay, so graph three coloring, when the language only considers the graph, the communication graph itself, is actually a very simple problem. This is non-interactive, this is just an NP proof. So how do you know if they accept or reject? I mean, is it just each of them say what they think and then... Each of them just say what they think, okay? If they all accept, I just call this, they accept. If one rejects, then you can think, you know, he has some emergency button he pushes and he starts communicating this, you know, in a different manner. But uh, you want somebody to, to notice that something happened. You don't tackle the issue of uh, learning inputs of another process or another? I didn't talk about zero knowledge at all. What? Nothing here is zero knowledge. I didn't say zero knowledge. I'm not protecting any information here. It's just a proof system, and we'll talk a bit about zero knowledge at the end. So now here's the other extreme. I claim that any language can be decided in this model if you let the proof size be like enough, okay? If you let it be like I can send n square, so this is just the graph, and if you let me send just the size of all the inputs. So really, what can the prover do, okay? So it just sends the whole input as a proof, okay? You'll just send it to all nodes. Every node uh, um, is going to verify that their neighbors received the exact same input. So this way you can force the prover to broadcast the same message to everyone. Okay, because if everyone checks that their neighbors got the exact same message, it must have been the same message to all of them because the graph is connected. Then they just check that their local view of G and this are consistent. So if I have xi, I'm going to check that the xi sent is the real one, and my local view of g is what uh, he sent in the graph. So now I have just one node that knows everything, and I didn't assume any computational assumptions, so he can just run in unbounded time and solve this. Okay. So this is like the trivial regime of the uh, of this model. So really, we're looking at out, uh, proofs that are either constant, okay, even one bit, or the maximum is this. Yeah. The verifier is just running an unbounded time. This is really yeah, for, so for this example, yeah, I just, uh, this model doesn't care about running time. Our actual results, the nodes will be very efficient, but just the model really doesn't care about running time. So What's the difference know? between this and what's called labeling? Yeah, proof labeling. So. So, so there was first this notion of labeling, which is very similar, only you trusted the prover, okay? And then this was generalized to proof labeling, 
where you label the nodes of the graph, but you don't trust the prover, so you wanted the proof. And this is like an interactive version of proof labeling. So I have a question. Uh, I, I was late, so I apologize. But okay, uh, go back. Suppose the local view is wrong, and... Uh, so one node yeah. sees that the local view is wrong, he raises a flag, so and, and no that's enough. Let's, he just rejects the proof, and the soundness says that if X is not a language, it, one node rejects. Yeah, and this is ex by this model, like you cannot really do like. It could be that the instance is in the language except you know one bit of the input, and only one node sees this. So really, like you have, like this is the best possible, unless you I don't know talk about proximity or stuff like that. Or computation. <laughs> <coughs> but also anything is a proof of length zero, right? So it just can communicate. So. No, but uh, so yeah. So they can. Uh, I measure the communication here, as well as the communication between the nodes and the prover. So like it's the same bound. Okay. So if they want to send something, then, then this is the proof size. Okay, it's both. So but if the nodes can only talk to their neighbors, then that means without a prover, they might not even be able to solve the problem. It might be impossible. Like, if, you, if, if nodes only know yeah. their neighbors, they don't know the full graph, and they can only... Yeah, if you only allow one round, yeah, like here. Here I allow one round because it's without loss of generality, because you have a prover that can simulate doing more rounds. But let's say you could have defined a variant where you talk to the prover for R rounds and then you talk locally for K rounds. And, and then you could solve anything when the number of rounds is enough to just share all the information. Yeah. It is like, okay, this is like a distributed protocol is always trivial with enough rounds. Okay, just send all the information to one guy and he just solves the problem. Okay. We're talking about which problems can be really efficiently verified with a prover in a distributed manner. Okay. So, Kolofman uh, and defined this model, and they had some, resu some results. These were results for um, specific languages, and mainly languages that cared only about the graph, the communication graph itself. So this was graph non-isomorphism, and they had also graph isomorphism and some other results, just highlighting uh, these. So they had an upper bound for this problem. I'm not going to define this problem exactly now, but it's some equivalent of uh, the classical graph non-isomorphism. So it's a four-round protocol, and the proof size was n log n. Okay, so this is below what is trivial, which is n squared. And they also had a log and lower bound for two rounds. Okay, and without, a, without interaction, you actually needed to send like the trivial n squared. So this was just really a proof that this model is actually powerful. Okay, you can go from things that had to be trivial to, to things that are much less than trivial. Without interaction? Inter without interaction, so you have just a prover that sends a proof, and that's it. And then they talk and they verify. You don't have, like, AM. Hmm? Oh, no, it's like an NP proof. It's not interaction. non-interactive, right? There's still interaction from the prover to the verifiers, interaction between the verifiers. So a non-interactive version would be that the prover sends a proof, and then they talk to their neighbors, and that's it. Yeah, it seems like a bunch of interaction still going on. But. OK, yeah. But a more interactive version would be that the verifier first send a challenge to the prover, then they get a response, and then they can share. What is all this then? What is AM? I know what's AM, what's PM, but what's this AM? So four rounds, so the, what? the D is distributed. And AM? And AM, so this is like the number of rounds. So Arlen, Methin, Arlen, Merlin. Just, you know who starts. Okay. So what, is, what are our results? So we actually have a general compiler. So we can take any, well, not any, a lot of standard interactive proofs 
and compile them to one that are distributed. Okay. And what we need is some efficiency of the, of the verifier in the standard proof. So if the verifier was somewhat efficient, uh, then we actually get an efficient distributed protocol. And this maintains the, this transformation maintains the prover complexity. Uh, so what do I mean? More precisely, if I started with an R round standard centralized protocol and the verifier could run in some bounded time, so in time t, okay. then I would get a distributed protocol. I would add two rounds, so it would be r plus two rounds, and the proof size is going to be t over n times log n. <coughs> okay. So if t was, let's say, n, and then this would be just a log n proof size. Okay. And we call that n is the number of nodes. It's not the input size. The input size might be bigger. Uh, just uh, you gave the example of uh, three coloring, yeah. which is simple. Just hint, how would you do uh, a Hamiltonian cycle? Well, we're going to see, like, uh, I'm going to more than hint. Okay. When you say bounded, you mean like polynomial, like n to the c or something? Or what, what do you mean? Where, no, the, the time, the running time is t. Yeah, where does the bound come from? The space. Yeah, okay, so this is like uh, RRR and this is GKR. So we're going to see the exact statement. Where does S and D come in? Yeah, yeah, but in general, let's think of just polylog space, okay? We'll, so if the verifier run in polylog space, or actually enter the epsilon space for small enough epsilon, then we get that we add some constant number of rounds and the proof size is going to be log n. And uh, this is, uh, so this is going to be constant depth. The constant will be some poly or exponential in 1 over epsilon? Or, I mean, in epsilon? In 1 over epsilon? So it's just take the GKR, like the... Um, you're going to suffer the same things that GKR suffer. Just going to show that you can actually take the GKR com and, and compile this distributed without any loss. It's just uh, roughly the same parameters. Um, so the centralized guy on the left, Yeah. Um, so the input of the problem would now would be the graph G and the additional x's. Mm -hmm. um, so in particular, the input has size n squared. So the, the input has, might have, some, like if it's a dense graph, n squared, and also the other inputs might be even larger. Sparse graphs. It could be, yeah, so sparse graphs, it could be linear. Yeah. So it matters also the representation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hmm? The representation of the graph also matters. The representation of the graph also matters, yeah. But, you know, just, let's just assume it's always n squared. So that means, okay. okay. And that's the, on the left you have sublinear time versus. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're going to talk about this also. But absolutely sure. The, if I'm a node, right, the I, uh, I can only send to my neighbors, squared. but do I know the graph? Yeah. yeah, so you don't know the graph. You don't, for our positive result, you don't need to know the graph. Yeah, it's part of the input that is distributed. So you might not know the graph. In some settings, maybe you know the graph, and then some parts can be like uh, easier. In general, I don't assume you know the graph. Also, the language can only depend on the graph. So if you know the graph and the language only depends on the graph, then everything is trivial. You know, can you remind again the parameters of DAP? What is the left and what is the right? Yeah, so I start with the R round protocol. Okay, and I end up with the R plus two round protocol. And what is the other? So one? I add two rounds, so and this is the proof size. This is the proof size. This is like a bound of the number of bits that's going to be sent on each and every edge, from the verifier to the prover, and also between themselves. This is this is the, just the bandwidth. Okay, overall. Yeah, but as one said, if the graph has n squared time, <laughs> if the graph is a size n squared. And even if you have a simple linear time algorithm, then this will be like n here. And you'll get an n log n proof size. So this is not enough. Okay. But th that's exactly why we have these two compilers. Okay. So you can do things on large graph, but as long as they have small depth or small space, then you get something much more efficient. Okay, so what we're gonna see is actually this, this compiler. And I'm going to talk about briefly how these two actually follow from this compiler. 
Okay. But this is really the, the main heavy lifting. Okay. Any other questions before I go on? Yeah. We have some additional results. Okay, these are like for specific problems. We're not going to see all of them. Uh, but just for comparison, like the GNI problem, so the previous result was four rounds with n log n proof size, and what we get is the same number of rounds, but we make the proof size log n. Um, so actually this, so this talk was given by Rotem last year at Simon's here, and she stated this permutation as an open problem, and so we, so actually one of our techniques is to solve this problem with the proof size of log n. Um, and I don't know, if we have time, we're going to see how we actually can add more rounds to bring the proof size to log log n. And this also solve, solves like a clique or leader election problem, which are maybe have other uh, applications. Um, OK. So we're going to see a protocol for a very clean problem called set equality. And this is really going to be the basis for the compiler. So the compiler is going to be like a simple reduction for this. And also permutation is going to be a simple reduction for this. So this is like the, a clean combinatorial problem that we solve and is really the heart of, of our compiler. So what is the problem? So every node has two values, OK? A and B. Actually, it has two lists of values, but let's just think of one value. OK, so I have like an, uh, a value A in my left hand and a value B in my right hand. Uh, over some field which is, has some poly n size. Now I'm going to define the set A as all the AU values, OK? So all the values that all nodes have in the left hand, and B, all the B values, so all the nodes that they have in my right hand, OK? Among all the nodes. And my goal is to verify that A equals B as sets, as actually as multisets, OK? Just that the set of all A values is the same as the set of all B values with multiplicities. OK? And this might be hard. I ha might have a 3 here and a 10 here, and Shafi might have a 10 and then a 7. And, but Shafi might be very far from me in the graph, so I cannot really check this. OK? And I can have many dependencies. And the idea actually goes back to Lipton in 89, and we're going to use read Solomon and codes, but in a way that is invariant to the order. And I think we saw similar things uh, throughout the workshop. Um, so we're going to encode the set A as a polynomial. And the way we're going to encode it is not treat the AIs as the coefficients, but rather just treat them as the solution to this polynomial. So we're just going to define this polynomial, OK, where all the A's are the solutions, are the roots. And the same for B. And uh, you, can, you can notice that uh, these two polynomials are equivalent if and only if the sets are the same. Okay, so the order of the elements doesn't affect, uh, doesn't affect this polynomial, only the elements and their multiplicity. So if an uh, element had higher multiplicity in the set, that it will be a root with higher mu multiplicity. Okay, so now what we're going to do, how can we check the two polynomials are the same? Okay, so this was used throughout this week. We're going to evaluate them on a random point. Okay, so we're going to somehow choose a random point S and somehow evaluate these polynomials on a random point. So this is our whole goal. So wasn't this trick for set equality used in one of the earlier talks, maybe by Ariel or someone? I don't remember that. Without, uh, I, so I have a very good collection of the okay. same. So maybe, yeah. So, well, it's back to 89, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it might be already used there. Uh, we, we saw a lot of, even after explicitly, like, this was used already, yeah. What do you mean when you say the, when you say multiset? Uh, multiset, so it's a set of elements. I don't care about the order, just if you're in and out. But you might be in the set, in the set but, like, have three times. You can be in the set with multiplicity three. What is called the bag? So multiset is a bag for you? I don't know what's a bag. Maybe a bag is a multiset. Uh, I allow repetition. So five could be in the set with multiplicity six, and three can be in the set with multiplicity two. 
When you consult the polynomial, yeah. you have a number which repeats many times. You'll have this many roots or single root. So the equivalent will be that this polynomial will have a root at this number, but the multiplicity of the root is going to be exactly the multiplicity of the element in the set. And I have a set and you have a set, and I have the number two twice, and you have the number two once. Once? Then the... the equal not equal. So I said the polynomials are the same if and only if the sets are equal as multisets, exactly, with multiplicities. Okay. So we reduce this to computing something more si simple, okay? So now we're going to see how we can compute some global function on the graph. <laughs> so... What was the original context of Lipton? What was the motivating implication? Like a, a hash function that uh, didn't care about the order of the elements, so you could like compute it online. And like that. <coughs> hash for sets. Okay, so first we're gonna compute a spanning tree, and because we don't know the, the graph, this is not a trivial task. Okay, we're gonna ask the prover to send every node u. So we're gonna ask the prover to compute some spanning tree of the graph, and I'm gonna ask the prover to send the parent of the tree. Okay, to every node. And uh, when I know my parent, then this defines the tree, because every node knows its parents. Okay. But we don't trust the prover. So we're going to also ask him to send the distance from the root, and also the idea of, of the root. Okay. So why are we doing this? So the prover gives you your pointer to your parent, okay? But there might be a cycle. Okay, I might point to somebody that points to somebody that points to me, so there might be a cycle. And also he might give two trees. It might be a forest. So we need to eliminate these two situations. So by sending the distance from the root and by verifying that my distance is exactly my parent's distance plus one, okay, I know that there cannot be any cycles. Okay, this cannot be consistent on a cycle. And by forcing him to broadcast the idea of the root, I just know that there is one single root. So this is really a tree. And this is going to be very useful. It's going to help us compute this polynomial. And the proof size for this was log n bits. Okay. <coughs> so what is going to be our protocol? We're going to first, the prover is going to send the verifier a tree, okay, along with the proof that this is a spanning tree. The verifier, now we have a root, okay, so we have a unique element. He's going to choose uh, this element S, okay, that we want to evaluate the polynomial on. He's going to send it to the prover. The prover is going to respond by broadcasting this, so everybody knows the, the element S. And he's going to give us these values. Okay. What are these values? Okay, I need to define them. So these are the, so TU is going to be the subtree at node U. So if this was node u, then this is his subtree. Okay. So what are these values? It's the evaluation of the polynomial up to this subtree. Okay. So if I didn't have a prover, what would I do? I would compute a tree, and then I would have all the leaves send their values to their parents. The parents can just do a multiplication, okay, and then send these values and so on. I'm just asking the prover to give me all these partial computations. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to verify the consistency of S, so he actually had to broadcast S. And then every node is going to verif verify that the product of what he got from all his children in the tree, okay, so this is all the VJs, all his children in the tree, uh, times this element, AU minus S, okay, so this is how evaluating the polynomial only by the point he knows. Okay, it equals what the prover gave him. And the same for B. And if all of this is consistent, then the root must have the product, the whole product, okay, of the polynomial. So, going back, we're taking this polynomial, okay, and every node can just compute one part, right? Every node knows B, BU and can compute S minus BU. Okay, and we're just slowly evaluating this up the tree. Okay. 
this gives us that set equality has a three round protocol. Right. So this was three rounds, and if you look at it a bit and massage this, you can actually make this two rounds, an AM protocol. Yeah. Is it, is it clear that the tree must come in the first round? I mean, clearly I need the polyamide. Well, that's why exactly I said that this is an AM. Yeah. So you don't really have to first commit to the tree and then start, you can actually. So everybody would send an S thinking, oh, I will be the root, and then somebody will see that I am actually the root, and you cancel all of this. Where's the log n coming from? The log n is there. Yeah, so the log n is, we, we, we needed log n for the tree, and also like the field has poly n size, so all these things are field elements, so it has like log n proof. In the tree, they just check with neighbors, no? Well, why it's a log n? The tree, the prover had to send three things. Your parent, so this is already log n bits. Then your distance for, from the root. These are not uh, communication. These are bits. bits. Okay. Yeah, log n bits. Yeah, one field. Okay. Uh, Do you know constant many field elements. Do you know any uh, MA lower bounds for this? Or in general for our other problems? Uh, yeah, so we have a uh, log n lower bound for AM for uh, GNI, for graph non isomorphism. Uh, yeah, we don't have better lower bounds. Not even MA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's just see how this thing is useful before we go to the actual compiler because we also going to need permutation. So that's just this permutation problem. So just, it's a simple problem. Every, everybody has just one value, AU, okay? It's a number between one and N. And we wanna decide that this is actually a permutation. And this is useful because the nodes originally just have unique IDs like your IP or something. They don't have like exact numbering between one and N. Okay, and this is a way where the prover can just give numbering and prove that he did this correctly. Uh, so how are we gonna reduce this problem to set equality? Okay. So the A values, we already have the A values. And we're just going to set the B values to be A1 plus AU plus 1 mod N. So this is just my B value. And I'm just going to prove this by example. So suppose this is the numbers he gave, okay, 3, 1, 4, 2. And so it's an actual permutation. Then the B values are going to be plus 1 mod N, so it's going to be 4, 2, 1, 3. Okay. And then these sets are actually equal, okay? These two sets are equal. But if he lied, if he did something like one, three, two, two, then we're gonna get two, four, three, three, okay? When you do plus one, and then these sets are actually not equal. So why can't we use their identities as the B values? So identities are some bits representing one thing. You use the identity as the B values? Because this can be arbitrary, except that they're unique, right? Yeah, yeah. it's arbitrary. But if you assume that they are the one to n? No, this is what I want to solve. I want to get ideas from 1 to n. Okay. This is exactly what I want to solve. This actually, for this, you don't even need to assume that they have ideas. You just need to assume that somehow they can talk to their neighbors, like they have some ordering of their neighbors, where I can talk to neighbor number one, neighbor number two. And they don't, you need to, you need to really assume that you know n, right? Because you could, you could think of a, right? You, you didn't want to tell them what the graph is. So yeah, so I'm, I'm going to assume I know n throughout this talk. You have to. And, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm mainly doing you a favor, so it depends exactly, like, uh, so if. Just for this. If you assume the graph is connected, and let's say you have some rough bound on n, then you can, uh, do this. And then you can actually compute n. Okay. So let's see the compiler. So um, assume I have some protocol pi. Okay, the standard protocol. 
And I'm going to first let the prover assign unique IDs, one to n, to all the nodes. OK, and we just saw how to do that. And uh, now every node is just going to send RU, its unique challenge. OK, so in the standard protocol, he would send some long string R. So now every node just sends a small piece of it. The prover is going to take all these random challenges. He's going to treat them as a capital R. I'm just going to compute what the prover would have sent back. So this is this message M. And then you're just going to split it evenly to all the nodes and send each node MU. OK, so I really did nothing here. And now somehow magically I need to verify that the original verifier, I said has some verifier, that would take the graph G, this challenge R, and the response M, that it actually would say yes, output 1. The question is, how can I simulate this computation? So let's start by assuming that this verifier it can be implemented by a circuit. Uh, so this is the circuit. So every gate is, uh, every node is going to be responsible for a gate. Okay, and if the circuit is, is larger than the number of nodes, then I'll just divide the gates evenly between the nodes. So Node i is responsible of gate g i mod n. And then the prover is just, so assume, let's say we take this gate, and g1 is responsible for this gate. The prover is just going to send me the value on this wire, the value on this wire, and the output value here. OK, so these are three values. And I'm assuming here like constant, constant fan in and constant fan out. And so I'm just going to locally check that this computation is correct, that the output wire is the end of the two input wires. OK. What is the problem here? Is that this output wire, for me, is an input wire for this person G4. OK. And I don't know that the value that he gave me as the output wire is the same value that he gave somebody else as the input wire. So we're going to define W to be the set of all the values of the input wires. We're going to define W prime to be the set of all of the values of the output wires. OK, and now, so what I mean the set is going to contain like the, the name of the wire and its value. OK, and now I want to make sure that these two sets are, are the same set. OK, he didn't cheat in any place. So this just goes exactly back to, back to set equality. So really, the prover is doing the whole computation for you, and then just giving out all the partial computations, and then using set equality to prove consistency that he didn't tell here, oh, yeah, the partial computation was x, and to somebody else y. Yeah? Verifier number nine needs to know that he is the output of the... Yeah, so the circuit... OK, so the circuit is... Uh, do I have this? Uh, yeah. So the circuit is... Uh, it's known, right? It's part, of, it's part of the standard protocol. So the circuit is known to everybody, OK? And then if I'm number four, then I know exactly the gates that I'm responsible. I need to know that, OK? But this is public. The structure of the circuit has nothing to do with the graph, OK? If I'm this guy, and this guy is not my neighbor in the graph, OK? I cannot just communicate and see that we got the same value. So if the original protocol had R rounds, then we're first going to just simulate these R rounds, OK? And then we need for the, for the compiler two more rounds, OK, for set equality. And the proof side is going to be just the size of C, OK, the number of gates, over n, plus log n for the set equality. Questions? OK, so now going back to what Ron asked at the beginning of the talk. So uh, first of all, where is the graph? OK, so the graph is part of the input. So it's going to be like read by this circuit, right? The verifier like reads all the input. So even if the graph is large, it's n squared, and my algorithm is sublinear, OK, then you know you just need at least a wire for every input bit. OK, so this circuit is going to be big. OK, so. Um, what we do is actually give a, a more direct compiler for RAM programs. Okay, and as in just in stock yesterday, 
I don't want to exactly define what a RAM program is, but this is a RAM program. <laughs> and uh, one advantage is you can do sublinear algorithms, okay, and you don't have to pay the, the input size. And um, actually, this goes back to a work of Blumetal for memory checking. Uh, in general, it's a bit more involved compiler, but again, reduces to set equality. Okay, the nodes do read and write to this global memory that they cannot see. The prover tells them the memory at location, at the time t, location i, had the value a, and uh, at the end, we want to check that the consistency between the reads and writes, okay, to this big RAM. So if you, if you like, sort of, <clears throat> try to compose it with the, with the permutation protocol in the end, you do get like some big polynomial, right? And this polynomial just like has a bunch of terms and like you sort of bunch the terms together. Each like node has its own terms and then you mm -hmm. like, uh, essentially just evaluate the random point to check if this polynomial is equal to zero. Yeah. Uh, is there like some, some general little framework that captures what can be done with this? I'm not sure. After yesterday, I started thinking about cellular automata, but uh, Okay, I need the, at least a few more days. Um, so the number of rounds, we just added two rounds for the set equality at the end. The proof size here is going to be t over n times log n. So it's a bit worse than t over n plus log n in the circuit. Uh, uh, immediate circuits. So best practice is really sparse graphs, as Ron said. One example is planarity testing, so we have a linear time algorithm for that. So we, this would give a three-round protocol with log n size proofs to test that the communication graph is actually planar. Question. You, you have some hidden assumption that what you ask about the graph is like uh, an NP, at most an NP-complete problem, an NP or or any, you can ask anything about the graph. Yeah, I'm not, I don't care about running time, so... You can ask, for example, suppose that the graph is a generalized chessboard, and the input is uh, some... You can ask halting yes. problem, problems, yeah. I wouldn't suggest this, but... Uh, How do you prove something like there is no, uh, there is no scheme for the, for the black to win? So you had to, ha for here, you had to start with a standard interactive protocol. So if I have, if I don't have even a standard interactive protocol, then, uh, this wouldn't apply. Yeah. You're measuring the proof size in bits, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> if uh, you need to talk uh, with the prover about uh, all the reads and writes through the computation, so that you can do the offline memory checking algorithm of uh, BGK and um, wouldn't you have to pay somewhere some t, t times log t because each of these uh, reads and writes have an address in them? Yeah, yeah. you'll have a yeah you'll have a timestamp. You'll have a timestamp in the proof. A timestamp would be like at point i in the time of the computation. Yeah, but when the timestamp appears a multiplicative factor in this proof size? Uh, yeah, it's, no, it's going to be like uh, plus log t. I think I hid it. Uh, so I, I have a, yeah, for this, for this exact statement, I have an underlying assumption that t is like poly n. Okay. Yeah, if t is like too large anyway, this is not interesting. So sure. That's why, yeah. Uh, like depends on the input sizes, right? So, uh, but still, I mean, this is an efficient simulation, whereas the other, the other approach with n squared proofs was uh, you were doing it yourself, whereas here you're preserving the the running time. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's maybe comparable. Uh, okay, maybe. So I have a question. Yeah. So trying to map this to some story. Okay. Um, you have this thing with the verifier raises a flag, right? Uh, is there some sense that uh, you could imagine that a verifier would, could prove that uh, the information that he got would uh, make him raise a flag? Um, like, so that he would have some trace which would be well, inconsistent, it's raised. inconsistent with what other people got and therefore 
But he has his transcript. There was a court for later, you know, in some sense, to show that indeed there was reason to doubt what the prover claimed. Yeah, but then he can, like, uh, say, claim he had some random string, which he didn't. I don't know. This is the proof. In general, yeah. is a model, that's something that... Yeah, that's a very good question, yeah. So you'd say that, I don't know, prover is Facebook, he's claiming something... <coughs> behaves in the network or the pattern of communication and then you want to cor the, the, the crowd has to kind of I agree to it. And then somebody says, no, it's wrong and I have a proof. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah, perfect completeness, right? So if, as long as you can uh, show that Facebook indeed sent you these messages. Perfect, you, well, no, you I'm just know it depends. Perfect completeness doesn't imply sound distance. So. No, no, but if, if you... Uh, so you have evidence that Facebook sent you these messages, yeah. and you can produce a particular random string that makes your algorithm reject. And that's a proof that Facebook was cheating. That's true. Yeah. Because you're talking about instances where X is in the language. So, so no, it depends. Sorry, why isn't just the truth? I mean, so you want that if his X is in the language, if somebody said no, then he could not prove that he uh, could not be able to prove that. Facebook is trying to uh, prove to you that X is, not in the, is in the language even though so it's not. You can show that Facebook is cheating. Yeah, but then if... Exactly. And then what you're saying doesn't hold. That's the story that I had yeah. in my mind. I mean, you could have another story. Right. But I'm like, why are these distributed verifiers? And, and why is it okay that one person says, uh, I yeah. reject? I mean, you want to somehow say that there's a way to... Yeah. yeah. So this depends on the setting. But if you just use this to take a verifier and, and run it in parallel on a supercomputer, then you know you just... Wait for some processor to say, I reject. But uh, the point is that you want to trust that processor. I trust. I have a supercomputer. I trust it. I just don't know how to parallelize this uh, heavy verifier that they have in some other prot protocol. Well, if you engineer the supercomputer, why would you have like, an arbitrary graph? I mean, you could tell whatever story you want. No, so uh, I'm just saying you, it, you don't ha need the supercomputer to have a click. Okay, no matter what the graph is. Maybe it's public, okay. But it, this works for any graph. Right. So I don't require that you have a parallel algorithm where all nodes can, all processors can communicate. And they don't know the input. You just distributed the input, which is very long, the proof, and just need somehow that they are connected. And also your set equality keeps coming up. So is that like complete in some sense for a set of problems? Yeah, I don't know. It's just very useful for us. I, uh, I don't know how to. The moment but if you have a general compiler, you have a solution to set equality. But the moment that you say deterministic, when you, say, when you, when you pick, you put the D in front, you mean deterministic? Distributed. What? Distributed. 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 So you use the power of probabilities here. Yes. You cannot have a like any interactive protocol. It's always randomized. Yeah. The streaming model, we would somehow with a special case, so say layer graph with the um, I don't know if they're exactly a special case, like in particular, but they're very connected. And the lower bounds are uh, essentially lower bounds, uh, similar to what uh, just in the practice, exactly this uh, streaming model. Why are so they? You would just assume that the graph is like two clicks and have one edge going in between, and then just have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they communicate. Yeah. But then the pool will talks to both Alice and Bob. If I forget about the distributed, if I forget about the distributed and look at it, just a communication between prover and verifier, okay? And when you say that everything is, uh, let's say, all log n or something like this, you are saying that everything can be proven. Yeah, but it's a communication on one edge. So if you just look at the all nodes as one entity, you have to multiply everything by n. You have to multiply everything by n. By n. Yeah. There are no, uh, no problems that interactive proof will require something exponential. Yeah, So, but if you co would compile these protocols, you would have the same uh, communication loss. So this t would be very large. Like, you need to at least read the communication, so this T would be very, very large. Okay, and you get trivial result. Okay, I don't have much time, so let me just say some last things. So 
So you can actually use this to compile uh, the RRR protocol and the GKR protocol. We at least saw this week uh, some talks about the GKR protocol. So, um, so the result is if you have small, so if the verifier actually has small space, let's say n to the epsilon, then you can have just a co constant more rounds, additive constant rounds, and the proof size is going to be log n. And similarly, if the verifier or the language okay, can be computed by uniform NC circuits, then you're going to suffer by additive poly log n rounds, and the proof size is going to be poly log n. And really just one slide on how we achieve these results. So both protocol you can break up to two steps. Okay. The first step does some arbitrary complicated computation. Okay, these are all these polynomials and checking and verifying and evaluating. Okay, but this is sublinear time. Okay, this is a small computation, but arbitrary. And the second, like the most heavy step of the verifier, is actually evaluating the input on a low degree extension. Okay, evaluating a low degree extension of the input on a random point. Um, so, very high level, this how these two protocols break down. And now we use the RAM compiler to just generally compile the first step. Okay, I don't know what it does, just I know that the running time is small enough. So I just compile this. And the second step, a low degree extension, this is exactly why we use the tree. So you can actually use the same kind of computation we did of the tree as we did with the polynomials to actually evaluate a low degree extension. So this way really you can just plug in GKR and RRR and get and get uh, and get these compilers, and uh, you don't have to go into all the details and try to distribute you know every step of the protocol. Of course, apply the RAM compiler, which is hard. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I have just two minutes just to finish up. Um, so, you know, we can get rid of interaction actually using Fiat Shamir. Uh, and a random oracle. Uh, this is not like exactly trivial, but it's more or less trivial because you cannot apply the random oracle on the, on the whole graph, okay, because no single node can do that. But you can get around this and you can compile these interactive protocols back to, if you know proof labeling scheme, so this would be the equivalent argument labeling scheme. So this is a, comp a computational variant analog of the proof labeling scheme. And uh, zero knowledge, here's just a simple way how to get zero knowledge, okay, from relatively heavy assumptions, um, in particular fully homomorphic encryption. So what would I do? I'll just have, I'll just generally compile any protocol, have the prover encrypt all the messages okay and send them to the so you just do the whole the whole uh, protocol encrypted at the end the node will just get all the uh, messages from its neighbors it's homomorphically gonna compute what the original node would have compute then it either has an encryption of zero or encryption of one okay and then the prover can just interact individually with every single node and prove that what he has underneath is actually an encryption of zero um, so that's more or less zero knowledge. Um, okay, yeah, I don't have time to show you how we go below the login barrier. We see super protocols. Uh, super <laughs> protocols, yeah. So let me just say that login seemed like a natural barrier for, for many problems because just sending an ID or an element field, everything like took login bits. But we show actually that using a bit more rounds, you can actually go to log log n bits or in sometimes even constant bits. Some open problems. So it's very hard to prove AM lower bounds. And that's why we have uh, some more restricted models. So this, I think, is a good model to show lower bounds. So even MA, don't have. MA uh, we have communication complexity. Is yeah. That? Yeah. So we're clear to so maybe, yeah, so I guess, yeah, if you have standard lower bounds, I guess. So it depends if you, like, uh, really talk about the nodes being efficient or not, and so you have to deal with that. Uh, we have a so communication, MA communication complexity lower bound when that is in bubble. Yeah, so 
but then uh, the input uh, length uh, increases, but the number of parts is only constant, right? So it's, it's, it's a little bit different uh, model. Can't you, right, but can't you somehow have Alice and Bob emulate like, each other in part of Yeah, but then uh, I can send you uh, order n bits, which will be charged by order one bit, because I'm sending you only one bit per edge. Mm. When you do well, but, you can, but, but you can cook up the graph, right? So you can make it into like two uh, clicks with one edge in between. So I think the problem is that um, in these protocols there might be like login bits per node from the from the prover, but across all the nodes total it's a lot of bits. In terms of the number of, uh, of prover. Yeah, you have a pro yeah, you have to have a, like a high lower bound there. And it's exactly the square root of Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can ask what happens if you have private randomness, or maybe the nodes have shared private randomness. Does this help? You can ask about a goldwasser sipser transformation in this, in this model. Of course, you can have better protocols for specific problems, OK? Not these general compilers. Maybe these are problems that you're interested in, like proving things on polynomials and stuff. And then you can have much more efficient things. <coughs> and of course, more applications. OK, thank you. Why not distributed bye-bye model? Yeah, that is a good question. So that doesn't work naively. Just doing bye-bye moron won't work here because it increases the communication by a lot. And then when you distribute this, it just becomes like trivial. Uh, but maybe identifying the problems for which you can do bye-bye moron in this model. That's a good Actually, is there a separation? Like, that if you do more rounds, you can do like more than. You cannot sort of sh like shrink rounds. Well, we have the lo log and lower bounds for AM, and then we can actually go be below that with more rounds. So you're going to have to pay. So, it ha yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like constant many more rounds. So. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you.